Assalamu alaikum brothers and sisters wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. I'd like to welcome you all to, I believe, our 14th session on the tafsir of Surah Al-Anbiya. And alhamdulillah, we've reached uh, ayah number 71. Where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَنَجَّيْنَا هُوَ لُوطًا إِلَى الْأَرْضِ الَّتِي بَارَكْنَا فِيهَا لِلْعَالَمِينَ And we delivered him and Lut to the land that we blessed for all people. As you recall, we were speaking about the, the incident involving Ibrahim alayhi salam and the polytheists of his community. And after destroying the idols inside of their temple, they decided to arrest Ibrahim, and ultimately they passed a verdict that he should be given the death penalty by burning him alive. So they construct this blazing fire and they catapult him into this inferno and as we mentioned last week allah subhanahu wa ta'ala intervened qulna ya nar kuni bardan wa salaman ala ibrahim now what happens after that you find that after ibrahim alayhi salam is thrown into the fire and Allah Azza wa Jal essentially intervenes and makes that fire cool and secure for Ibrahim. Numrud, according to traditions, he he's told that Ibrahim is in the fire and he didn't die. He survived. So Numrud orders his guards to retrieve Ibrahim from the fire. And they take him immediately to the court or to the palace of Numrud. So Numrud now wants to speak to Ibrahim face to face. Now, when he arrives, when Ibrahim arrives, and again, remember that Ibrahim السلام, is a teenage boy, 16, 17, 18 years old at most. He's brought before Numrud, who is the king of the time. And Namrud asks Ibrahim, who is your Lord? You reject our gods, you reject the idols. Who is your Lord? And this is the conversation that is mentioned in the Quran. So after they attempt to kill Ibrahim by throwing him into the fire and he survives, the next thing that happens is there is this debate, this discussion between Ibrahim and Numrud, and this is mentioned in Surah Al-Baqarah, Surah number 2, Ayah number 258. Allah says, Bismillahirrahmanirrahim, Alam tara fi Have you not heard, have you not seen the one who debated with Ibrahim with regard to his Lord? And atahu Allahu al-mulk. Allah gave this individual who was debating Ibrahim the kingdom. He had authority. So when Namrud asks Ibrahim, who is your Lord? Ibrahim says, my Lord is the one who gives life and causes his creatures to die. He is the giver of life and he is the taker of life. Now here, Numrud, he says, قَالَ أَنَا أُحِي وَأُمِيتِ That I, أَنَا أُحِي وَأُمِيتِ I also give life and I, I take it away. And narrations mention that Numrud summons two prisoners from his dungeons. He kills one of them and then he spares the other. And he, as he essentially tells Ibrahim that, see, I, I give life and I take it away. Then, you know, this was supposedly his, his response. Then what does Ibrahim say next? Now look at the, the, uh, 
you know, the ability, the sharpness of Ibrahim. So he sees that he's dealing with someone who's playing a game with him. Qala Ibrahim. Allah continues in the ayah. Qala Ibrahim. فَإِنَّ اللَّهَ يَأْتِي بِالشَّمْسِ مِنَ الْمَشْرِقِ فَأْتِ بِهَا مِنَ الْمَغْرِبِ فَأْتِ بِهَا مِنَ الْمَغْرِبِ Ibrahim says, my Lord, if you think that you can give life and you can take it away, my Lord is the one who causes the sun to rise from the east. If you are God, if you claim to be a God, make it rise from the west. Allah says in the Quran, Namrud was dumbfounded. He had no reply. After this incident, after this debate between Namrud and Ibrahim salam, Namrud decides to exile Ibrahim and his followers. Now, some of the Mufassireen, they say that Ibrahim was exiled, but he had already finished, he completed his mission in Kutha, in the, the city that he was living in. So he leaves for two reasons. He leaves, number one, because he finished, he completed his divine mission in that region. And secondly, he was exiled. He was exiled by Numrud. Ibrahim and his followers were exiled. Now in this ayah, in ayah number 71, Allah says, وَنَجَّيْنَاهُ And we delivered him, meaning Ibrahim. We delivered him and Prophet Lut. So you see, we understand from this verse that Prophet Lut was with Ibrahim in the city when Ibrahim was a teenager. And incidentally, Lut السلام, was the first one to believe in Ibrahim, he was his first supporter, you know, in the, in the same way that you know, Ali ibn Abi Khadija and Ali ibn Abi Ta, they were the first ones to support the Prophet. We find here that Lut السلام, is Ibrahim's first supporter. Now, incidentally, we have a riwayah, a tradition from Imam al Baqir where he says that Prophet Lut is actually the maternal cousin of Ibrahim. They're cousins. And Ibrahim salam's mother, you know, because uh, she feared for, uh, for his life, she, she tucked him away in a nearby cave. And he spends the first about 12 years of his life living in complete isolation. So when he comes out of isolation in those few years where he's preaching and he's disseminating the message of Tawheed, he, he receives the support of his maternal cousin, Lut. Now, Ibrahim is exiled. Lut is exiled with him. And there are a number of followers that join him. Now, there are some people that follow Ibrahim. There's also a narration that mentions that there was one tribe, one clan that joins Ibrahim. And this clan... They, they are essentially the ancestors of Ayyub, Shu'ayb, and Bal'am ibn Ba'ura, these prominent personalities. Now, when Ibrahim is preparing to leave the city that he was born in, and you know, before I forget, brothers and sisters, it's important for us to remember that these ayat in, in one way, is also consoling the Prophet. These verses are intended to, to console the Prophet, to give him comfort, to strengthen his resolve. So in the same way that Ibrahim and Lut are being exiled with their followers, they have to leave, they have to go on a hijrah, the Prophet ﷺ will also go on a, a hijrah. So again, What's happening to the Prophet in Mecca, what will happen to him in the next you know, few years is not something that's new. This is not a new hardship. This is something that past Prophets also had to endure. Now when Ibrahim salam is asked, 
where are you going to go? You're leaving the city, you've been exiled, you've been expelled from Kutha. Where are you going to go? His answer to that question is found in Surah Safat, Surah 37, verses 99 and 100. So it seems that Ibrahim is asked, where are you going to go next? And he replies, وَقَالَ إِنِّي ذَاهِبٌ إِلَىٰ رَبِّي سَيَهْدِينَ I am emigrating, I am traveling to my Lord, and he shall guide me. You see, what Ibrahim means is that I'm going to go to a place where I am free to worship God, or where I am free to propagate his message. So you see that even when it comes to where Ibrahim will go, what will be his destination, his, he, he chooses a location based on his ability to serve Allah, meaning that that is the criterion. The criterion for where we will live, where we will settle, is that I will settle wherever I feel that I can serve my Lord. So similarly, whenever we travel, whenever we move and we want to relocate, we have to also ask, is this place that we're moving to, is this environment that we are going towards, is it going to be conducive to our spiritual development? Will, will we be able to retain our faith and draw closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And then he says in ayah number 100 of Surah Safat, Rabbi Hebli min as salihin. O Allah, O my Lord, grant me righteous children. You see, Ibrahim alayhi salam from a very young age, when he was a teenager. He was asking Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to give him a righteous progeny. Ibrahim wanted to make sure that after his death, there will be those who will carry on his message, who will continue his work, who will continue preaching tawheed, who will carry the torch. So you see that Ibrahim alayhi salam is already thinking about the future. He's only a teenager and he's also. He's also planning and thinking about the future of his small ummah. So Lut السلام, as I mentioned, he was his first supporter. He pledges to join him. He goes on a hijrah with, with uh, Ibrahim. And Lut السلام, in Surah Al-Ankabut, Surah 29, ayah number 26, Allah mentions the faith that Lut has in Ibrahim. فَآمَنَ لَهُ لُوطٌ Lut believed in him, meaning that Lut was subservient to Ibrahim. وَقَالَ إِنِّي مُهَاجِرٌ إِلَىٰ رَبِّي إِنَّهُ هُوَ الْعَزِيزُ الْحَكِيمُ I am emigrating to my Lord. Again, they have the same intention they have the same objective they have the same mindset now narrations tell us because of Lut's unfailing devotion and support for Ibrahim السلام, at this moment at this point he is appointed as a prophet now he's ma'soom he's infallible you know even before he begins he assumes this position but this is where where, where Nabi Lut السلام, is designated by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as a prophet. It's very similar to the case of Harun. Harun was appointed by, by uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as a prophet upon the request of Musa. Here, after Lut demonstrates his unwavering devotion and faith and support, and his love for the truth and his devotion to the truth, he is appointed as a prophet. Now Allah says, going back to the, the verse, ayah number 71, And we delivered him and Lut to the land that we blessed for all people. Now what is this land? Where did they go? 
narrations indicate that this blessed land is a reference to the Levant, which roughly corresponds with modern day Syria, Palestine, Lebanon, parts of Jordan, that region. And within that region is, you know, uh, Masjid al Aqsa, where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala also mentions this idea of a blessed land. Subhanallah, asra bi abdihi laylan min al masjid al harami ila al masjid al aqsa ladi barakna hawla. That Masjid al Aqsa is that place where Allah has blessed even the precincts, even the, the perimeter of that region, the surrounding region. Now, why is this place considered a blessed place for all people? Now, it's blessed for materialistic reasons and it's blessed for spiritual reasons. This region is a place of very fertile soil. So it's a place that has worldly advantages. It's geographically very blessed. It's a place that is very rich with natural resources, rich with water, with varieties of foods. But more importantly, that it is a blessed place because many, many prophets, tens and tens, if not hundreds of prophets, maybe even in the thousands, they emerged from this region. If you look at the most of the prophets who have been sent, they come from this area, the Levant. So this area, which is known in the Ahadith as the Greater Sham, a Shamat, as some narrations mention, that this is, you know, you know how they speak about the cradle of civilization. This is the cradle of revelation. It's the cradle of revelation. Many prophets lived in these areas. They disseminated their message in these regions. So it's a place that is very spiritually charged. It's a spiritual atmosphere. It is the home of revelation. It is the home of prophethood. It is the home of risala. So you see that even in the Quran, there is this idea of places being blessed because of the personalities that dwelled in those places. You know, this is why we consider Najaf blessed. This is why Karbala is blessed. This is why Kadhimiya is blessed, why Samarra is blessed. What makes a place blessed to a degree is What makes a place blessed is the personalities that reside in that area. Now, if we go, uh, before we go to the next verse, I number uh, 72, one of the reasons why people refrain from enjoining good and forbidding evil is that there is this fear that you're going to put yourself in danger or you're going to end up losing things losing money losing position putting your your uh, yourself in harm's way because if you look at the story of ibrahim the story of ibrahim is a story of amr bil ma'ruf and nahi anil munkar enjoining good and forbidding evil now the reason why Amr bil ma'ruf wa nahi anil munkar is one of the most neglected religious obligations is because people don't like confrontation. You know, you end up, you have to risk, you know, your reputation. You have to, you, there's a risk that's taken. So there's this, there's this fear of loss, even if it's at a subconscious level, there's this fear of loss. Now, look at what Allah says in the next ayah. Ibrahim makes all of these sacrifices. He puts himself in danger all for the sake of enjoining good and forbidding evil. Now, what does Allah? Allah then speaks about what he gives Ibrahim. Right? So he may have lost in the sense that he was expelled from his homeland, that you know, maybe he had maybe 
you know, he, he, he obviously faced some difficulties, but what you lose in the process of Amr bil ma'ruf wa nahi anil munkar is incomparable to what Allah gives you in place of it. Ayah number 72. وَوَهَبْنَا لَهُ إِسْحَاقَ وَيَعْقُوبَ نَافِلَةً وَكُلًّا جَعَلْنَا صَالِحِينَ Ibrahim a.s. Enjoys, enjoins good, forbids evil. They try to kill him. They try to finish him off. Here Allah says, And we bestowed upon him Isaac, and Jacob as an added gift, and each of them we made righteous. Now, if you recall, as Ibrahim السلام, is leaving the city, he says, as I mentioned in Surah Safat, I am traveling to my Lord, I am emigrating towards my Lord, he shall guide me. And then he makes the dua. Rabbi Habli Mina Salihin. Oh Allah, grant me a righteous progeny. He made that dua when he was a teenager. When does Allah answer that dua? You know, so Allah answered his dua. But Allah here is trying to tell us that sometimes I answer your dua, but you don't see the, the result until later on. He makes the dua when he's a teenager. When he's an old man, Allah gives him Ismail and Ishaq. And then from Ishaq, there is Ya'qub. So what's interesting here is that, number one, he makes a dua. The dua is answered. But the effect of that dua is seen many, many decades later. So when we make dua, we should not assume that because I don't see anything happening, because I don't see the answering of my dua, that doesn't mean that your dua was rejected. Secondly, you find that Ibrahim, what does he pray for? He prayed for righteous children. Now here is an example of you making dua and Allah giving you even more than what you asked for. That's why Allah says, وَوَهَبْنَا لَهُ إِسْحَاقُ We gave him Ishaq. We bestowed upon him Ishaq. وَيَعْقُوبَ نَافِلَةً Not only did we give Ibrahim a righteous son, we also gave him a righteous grandson. Now, you know how we have the nafila prayers, which are the extra prayers, the recommended prayers. So Allah gives Ibrahim Ishaq. And in addition to that, he gives him even more than what he asked. He says, I give you Ishaq and I also give you Ya'qub. And then from Ya'qub, you have the Anbiya of Bani Israel. So this is the, the beauty of dua that when someone is sincere and you make dua to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala you supplicate to him because of your sincerity Allah gives you even more than what you expect he gives you even more than what you ask for and interestingly you find that in the Quran when Allah speaks about children when he speaks about dhurriya progeny he uses the verb gift وَوَهَبْنَا And we gifted him Ishaq. You know, وَهَبْنَا comes from, from the word hiba, which means gift. And indeed, you know, for those of you who have children or you have grandchildren, it's truly a gift from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And this is also a reminder that we have to treat our children and our grandchildren like they are divine gifts. We shouldn't abuse them. We shouldn't, you know, torment them. We shouldn't, you know, physically or verbally harm them. That we have to remember that these are gifts that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given 
to us. So we have to be, we have to be mindful of how we treat them. Now, when it comes to Ishaq, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions the story of how Ibrahim was given the glad tidings of uh, the birth of Ishaq. In Surah 51, Ayah 24 to 28, Allah says, هَلْ أَتَاكَ حَدِيثُ ضَيْفِ إِبْرَاهِيمَ الْمُكْرَمِينَ has, not come to you, has it not come to you? Have you not heard of the story of the guests, of the honorable guests of Ibrahim? Now, Ibrahim, alayhi salam, he owned this, this, uh, this, he was on this farm, and he was looking out at his land. He was gazing at his land, and he saw four strangers walk and basically enter into his land and they greeted him allah says in ayah number 25 uh, they said salam to him these four men he he replies to their greeting and he you know they were strangers to him he didn't know who they were he invites them inside of his home. فَرَاغَ إِلَىٰ أَهْلِهِ فَجَاءَ بِعِجْلٍ سَمِينٍ Ibrahim السلام, being the generous person that he is, he, he, he basically brings them into his home and he goes to his wife and he asks her, he, he, he asks her to prepare a fat calf. Meaning that he prepares the best food that he has, he, you know, he doesn't even ask them if they're hungry. He goes and he anticipates their needs, you know. So we learn, you know, some principles of hospitality from Ibrahim He presents the food to them. He notices that none of these four individuals are extending their hands to partake in the, the meal. Then in ayah number 28, Allah says, فَأَوْجَسَ مِنْهُمْ خِيْفَةً At that moment, Ibrahim felt some fear in his heart. He was afraid of them. They were strange. He's, he's presenting food to them. He's offering them food. None of them are eating. And that is when they reveal themselves to Ibrahim. قَالُوا لَا تَخَفْ وَبَشَّرُوهُ بِغُلَامٍ عَلِيمٍ They say, don't fear. In other ayat, it's mentioned that they're it's mentioned that they're angels, and they give him the glad tidings of a son. And this is after the birth of uh, Ismail. They give him the glad tidings of the birth of Ishaq, whose mother is Sarah. And then the son of Ishaq is Yaqub, and Yaqub was given the honorary title, the honorific title of Israel. Yaqub's title, his honorific title is Israel, which means the servant of God. And therefore you find Yaqub, he has a son by the name of Yusuf, and all of the prophets of Bani Israel are the children of who? They're the children of Yaqub. And this is perhaps why Ismail is not mentioned. Because there are more, at least from the from the standpoint of quantity, there are more prophets from the line of Ishaq. From the line of Ismail, it seems that we only have Rasulullah and the Ahlul Bayt. And because this is Surah Al Anbiya and the other prophets that will be mentioned in this Surah, they are from the progeny of Ishaq and Yaqub. Ayah number 73. And and we made them imams, guiding by our command. And we revealed to them the doing of good deeds 
the performance of prayer and the giving of alms, and they were worshipers of us. Here Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, in addition to telling Ibrahim that, in addition to saying that we bestowed Ishaq and Ya'qub upon Ibrahim, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala here says that we didn't only give him a progeny, and we didn't only make prophets from his progeny, nor did we only make messengers from the progeny of Ibrahim. We made imams from his progeny. We made Ibrahim an imam. So when Allah says, and we made them imams, them is a reference to Ibrahim, Ishaq, and Ya'qub. So according to this ayah, these three prophets are also imams. If you recall, if you remember in Surat Al-Baqarah, ayah number 124, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, wa rabbuhu bi kalimatim Allah tested he tried ibrahim with certain trials and he successfully passed those divine trials because of the dua that ibrahim makes immediately after allah appoints him to the position of imam how about my progeny question when was ibrahim given progeny later on in his life when he was an elderly man so he asks Allah, Qala wa min Is there anyone from my children, my grandchildren, my descendants? Are any of my descendants going to also reach this level of imama? Allah says, Qala la yanalu This covenant will never reach the unjust. So Allah answers his dua, meaning that. In the progeny of, of Ibrahim السلام, you have Imams, his son, Ishaq. Ya'qub is also an Imam. Now, there's a hadith from, a narration from Imam al-Sadiq, where he speaks about Imama. Now, in the Quran, Imam al-Sadiq says, إِنَّ الْأَئِمَّةَ فِي كِتَابِ اللَّهِ إِمَامًا the Imam says that there are two types of Imams that are mentioned in the Quran. You know, some of us, we, have, we, we might assume that Imam always has positive connotations. However, in the Quran, there are, there are Imams who are condemned and there are Imams who are praised and appointed by God. Imam al-Sadiq says, There are two types of imams mentioned in the Qur'an. And then he cites this ayah of the Qur'an. And we made them imams guiding by our command. These are the positive imams, the divinely endorsed imams. يَهْدُونَ بِأَمْرِنَا لَا بِأَمْرِ النَّاسِ Imam al-Sadiq says they guide by God's command, not by people's command, meaning they're not appointed by people. يُقَدِّمُونَ مَا أَمَرَ اللَّهُ قَبْلَ أَمْرِهِمْ They give priority to what God commands over what people desire. وَحُكْمَ اللَّهِ قَبْلَ حُكْمِهِمْ they give priority to God's judgment over the judgment of others. So this is one type of imam. Imams who give God's command priority, who are not swayed by the whims and the desires of people, who are not appointed by people. And then the second type of imam, قَالْ وَجَعَلْنَا أَئِمَّةً يَهْدُونَ إِلَى النَّارِ The Quran speaks of imams Leaders who guide people to hell. 
to hellfire. Why do they guide, why do they take people to hell? يُقَدِّمُونَ أَمْرَهُمْ قَبْلَ أَمْرِ اللَّهِ Because they give priority to the commands of others over God. وَحُكْمَهُمْ قَبْلَ حُكْمِ اللَّهِ They give priority, they give more weight to the judgment of people, to the judgment of others, to their own judgment above God's judgment. وَيَأْخُذُونَ بِأَهْوَائِهِمْ خِلَافَ مَا فِي كِتَابِ اللَّهِ and they follow, they don't follow God's commandments, they follow their desires. Now, in this ayah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala then describes the function and the role of an imam. وَجَعَلْنَاهُمْ أَئِمَّةً We made them imams, and then what comes after is basically a description, an explanation as to what it means to be an imam. Number one is, and we'll take it, you know, I'll, I'll break the verse down very slowly. Yahduna bi amrina. Number one, yahdun. They guide. They guide by our command. Now, the question here is Ibrahim, Ishaq, and Yaqub. Were they not prophets before they were imams? Yes, they were prophets. What's the difference between imama and nubuwa? And imama and risala? Because Allah is saying that we made them imams who guide by our command. Don't prophets also guide? Don't messengers also guide? So this, this guidance, yahduna bi amrina, is different from the general guidance that is given by prophets and messengers. Because there has to be a distinction. Because all prophets guide, all messengers guide. Allah here is speaking about the job description of imams, yahduna bi amrina, because there are two ways to guide. Number one is iraatul tariq, showing people the way. And this is what prophets do. This is what messengers do. They show people the way towards God. Iraatul tariq. And then the second, so. The second way is what? Al-Isalu ila al-Matloob, taking someone to the destination. I'll give you a very simple example. If you ask someone for directions, there are two ways that they can give you directions. Either, especially, you know, let's pretend that it's 20, 30 years back before we had GPS or anything. If you ask someone for directions, they can either, they can show you, they can give you directions. They show you the route. They show you the way. You know, make a right, make a left, go 10 miles, and it's on your right side. They show you the way. Or a second way is that I'll get in my car and I'll, you follow me and I'll take you to the destination. The difference between Nubuwa, Risala, and Imama is. Nubuwa is showing the way. Imama is something even greater, and that is taking the individual to the desired destination. Let me explain this a little bit more. What makes this guidance different from the guidance that is given by prophets and imams is encapsulated in the phrase bi amrina. Yahduna bi amrina. Now, what is the meaning of yahduna bi amrina? 
is this guidance that is given by imams like Ibrahim, Ishaq, Yaqub, our prophet, the imams of Ahlul Bayt, is this tashri'i guidance or taqweeni guidance? Are we talking about legislative guidance or existential guidance? Because it, all, prophets and messengers, all of them provide legislative guidance. Pray, fast, do this, do that, refrain from this, perform that. This is tashri'i guidance. And this is not the guidance that we're talking about here. We're not talking about legislative guidance. We're not talking about tashri'i guidance. We're talking about taqweeni guidance. Taqweeni guidance is what? This is a sort of generative control, and it's a sort of existential intervention in the souls by facilitating the guidance of others. Basically, what it means is that these individuals are given the ability to, guide, to directly guide the hearts of people. Meaning Allah has now designated them with this taqweeni ability that if someone has goodness in their heart, they take on, they guide directly. They have a type of manipulation and authority over the hearts of people. Yahduna bi amrina, they guide by our command. Bi amrina. What is what is what is the what is the meaning of bi amrina? By our command. If you go to Surah Yasin. Ayah number 82, Surah 36, Ayah number 82, Allah says, Innama amruhu. Now Allah here is explaining the meaning of am. Yahduna bi amrina means what? Guiding by, here is the explanation. Innama amruhu idha arad shay'an ayyakula lahu kun fayakun. God's command is such that when he says be to something, it is. When imams guide, there is a type of authority that they're given over the hearts of people. And they are able to intervene and facilitate people's guidance. They're able to take them by the hand and take them to those spiritual levels. So Allah guides the hearts through them. It's very different. Yahduna bi amrina. Now, when a, when a random prophet guides, they preach, they, they try to invite people towards Tawheed. But what is it? Who decides what heart is going to gravitate towards Haq and which one is going to remain on the sideline or dormant? Of course, Allah is the ultimate guide. But He, the grace of Hidayah now goes through these Imams. Because they guide by Allah's command. This is an taqweeni guidance. Yahduna bi amrina. Anyone who wants to be guided, Allah guides them. But He guides them through these individuals. They're granted authority over the hearts of people. In the same way that Allah is muqallib al qulub, He's the turner of hearts. This ability is given to these Imams. Ibrahim, Ishaq, Yaqub, and any individual who rises to the rank of Imam. وَجَعَلْنَاهُمْ We made them. Again, a reminder. These are not people who are appointed by human beings. They are, they're not elected to be Imams by public, by popular vote. They are designated. They are divinely chosen. يَهْدُونَ بِأَمْرِنَا And then here. وَأَوْحَيْنَا إِلَيْهِمْ فِعْلَ الْخَيْرَاتِ وَإِقَامَ الصَّلَاةِ وَإِتَاءَ الزَّكَاةِ وَكَانُوا لَنَا عَابِدِينَ What does this mean? And we revealed to them the doing of good deeds, the performance of prayer, and the giving of alms. So I have a question now. What does it mean when Allah says, and we reveal to them, فعل الخيرات وإقام الصلاة and إتاء الزكاة? 
Is Allah saying that I, I reveal to them to do good and to pray and to give charity? Is, is this, is, this, is Allah speaking about tashri' to them? Is Allah telling Ibrahim and Ishaq and Yaqub, by the way, I want you to do good deeds, and by the way, I want you to pray, and by the way, I also want you to pay charity. Is this the meaning of وَأُوحَيْنَا إِلَيْهِمْ فِعْلَ الْخَيْرَاتِ Absolutely not. Because Ibrahim and Ismail and Yaqub, and Yaqub, these individuals are already doing these things. You think Ibrahim, when he becomes an Imam, Allah says, okay, now you need to pray. He's been praying all his life. They've been paying charity all their lives. They've been doing good. So it's not that Allah is telling them to do good or telling them to pray or telling them to fast. Because this is some, because again, Allah here is describing imama. Other prophets might tell the people to pray. So here we're not talking about al fi'lu tashri'i. Allah is not telling them do good or pray. So what is the meaning of this? وَأَوْحَيْنَا إِلَيْهِمْ فِعْلَ الْخَيْرَاتِ وَإِقَامَ الصَّلَاةِ وَإِيْتَاءَ الزَّكَاةِ and, and, and the reason why I say, the end of the verse says what? وَكَانُوا لَنَا عَابِدِينَ And they were worshippers, meaning they were praying, they were giving zakat, they were doing all of these acts of worship. So there, what is this new type of wahi that they are receiving? Ibrahim has been receiving uh, revelation all his life. He has been receiving revelation as a, as a Nabi. He has been receiving revelation as a Rasul. Ya'qub is the same. Ishaq is the same. What is this new type of wahi that they are receiving as Imams? What is this new type of wahi? This new type of revelation is not the type of revelation where they are instructed to do things or deliver things to the people. This type of wahi is an inspiration, meaning that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives them special support. He gives them, he strengthens their resolve even more. This is the same type of support, and this is what Alama Tabatabai mentions, that this is a type of divine support that is given to them. It's an extra motivation, an extra type of resolve, this extra spiritual stamina that they're given when they reach this maqam of imam. And this is, Alama Tabatabai, he says, this is similar to the Holy Spirit that strengthens Isa. وَآتَيْنَا عِيسَ بْنَ مَرْيَمَ الْبَيِّنَاتِ We gave Isa ibn Maryam uh, the bayinat, the clear signs, the miracles. وَأَيَّدْنَاهُ بِرُوحِ الْقُدُسِ And we supported him with the Holy Spirit. So when someone reaches the maqam, the station of Imam Man, they receive a special type of divine support whereby they are motivated and they have this incredible spiritual endurance to do good deeds, to pray. You know, that's why you cannot compare the ibadah of Ali ibn Abi Talib to others. Imam Amir al muminin can stand in his mihrab the entire night. Why? Because they have, they receive this type of divine grace, this divine stamina, this resilience to do good deeds, to establish prayer, to give alms. And they were always worshiping us, meaning this revelation, this wahi that they receive as imams is not an instructional wahi. It's a type of divine inspiration that fortifies the heart to do good at a level that is much greater than others. It's a type of 
endure, spiritual endurance that they're given by virtue of this divine inspiration. And you notice how Allah doesn't only say that we inspired them the doing of good deeds. He's out of, and then out of these good deeds, salah and zakat are mentioned. So the general is mentioned, al-am, and then al-khas. Specific good deeds are mentioned. And out of all of the specific good deeds Allah could have mentioned, he mentioned salah and zakat to emphasize the importance of these actions, meaning no matter how high you rise, no matter how high you ascend on the spiritual ladder, you will always need salah and zakat. You will always need salah. As Isa alayhi salam says, وَأَوْصَانِي بِالصَّلَاةِ وَالزَّكَاةِ مَا دُمْتُ حَيَّةِ God commanded me to establish prayer and give alms for as long as I live. There is no one who can say that I am now so spiritually elevated that I don't, I don't need salah anymore. I don't need to give charity because I'm, I'm selfless. I'm generous. Salah and zakat will always be a crucial part of a person's spiritual regimen. With that, inshallah, we'll conclude. وَصَلَى عَلَى سَيِّدِنَا وَنَبِيِّنَا مُحَمَّدْ وَعَلَى أَهْلِ بَيْتِهِ الطَّيِّبِينَ الطَّاهِرِينَ Any questions or comments? Welcome, Sheikh. So could you clarify a little bit about this, uh, the special guidance that's given by a mama? Because it seems like being an imam, there's something about them that makes them better at conveying the message to receptive hearts, possibly. Perhaps because they have the spiritual stamina to work harder at it than other people. Is this accurate or is there more to it than this? So it seems to it that there's more, there's more to it than this. Because Allah says, وَجَعَلْنَاهُمْ أَئِمَّةً يَهْدُونَ بِأَمْرِنَا This guiding by our command, it doesn't just mean that they're eloquent or they, you know, they're able to deliver the message more eloquently or in a more understandable way. This is actually referring to a type of authority. They're granted a type of authority over people's souls and hearts. Meaning that if Allah wants to guide, He does it through through them. In the same way that when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants to send down rain, there are certain intermediaries. You know, there's an angel that's in charge of risk, and then there are clouds. So there are certain things that are set in motion. When Allah wants to guide, how does He guide? That it seems that He does it through the medium of these special uh, individuals. And they would obviously have to be given this type of knowledge of the unseen. When, when Allah, Allah gives them ilmul ghayb, when it is necessary for them to fulfill, uh, to fulfill this function. So Allama Taba Taba, he says that yahduna bi amrina, this is a, uh, a taqwini hidayah. It's not that, you know, because otherwise, if we say yahduna bi amrina means that they guide people, meaning they preach, they give advice, then there would be no difference between imama and prophethood because prophets do that. So necessarily, the description that follows wajalnahum imatan, it there has to be some distinction between the functions of an imam and the functions of uh, prophets and messengers. So one of the things that's mentioned is that imams, so prophets, they, uh, they receive the message, mess prophets and messengers receive the message and they deliver it. But imams have an additional mandate and that is to enforce the law of God. See, there's a difference between receiving revelation and then delivering it, delivering the message. But enforcing the message this is the mandate of an imam, Ibrahim. Now, whether they were able to do it during their lifetime or not, that's a separate issue. But they, are, they have that authority that if, if, the, uh, if, if circumstances allow it, you know, so for example, if, uh, so if, if Ibrahim and Lut, they're living in the same city, for example, and let's say 
the circumstances allow for the establishment of the law of God, Ibrahim would enforce it because he's an imam and Lut is not an imam. They're both prophets. They both guide. They both deliver what is revealed to them. But enforcing the divine message is the is part of the uh, the mandate of an imam. And as as you see. Some individuals were both prophets and imams. They were prophets, messengers, and imams. And then you have certain individuals who are only imams because the nubuwa has ended. Imam Ali ibn Abi Talib, Imam al Hassan, Imam al Hussein. So you can't say that all oh, there are others who are superior to them because they were prophets and imams. There is no nubuwa for you to hold that against the imams of Ahlul Bayt. The point is they are at that level of imam. They are charged with they. They have that authority to enforce the law of God if circumstances allow. And so was Prophet Musa also an imam? Was Prophet Musa also an imam? I, I believe so if I'm, not, uh, if I'm not mistaken. But I would have to double check. We would have to have... Uh, something that uh some evidence from the uh the the uh, riwayat i would imagine that that he is he has also reached uh that uh level it seems that the prophets of ulul azm if i'm not mistaken they were they were imams but again i i, I don't want to don't take my word for it we'd have to uh to look at the evidence but from this ayah, we understand very clearly that Ibrahim, Ishaq, and Yaqub. And we know, and we could say that because the prophets of Ulul Azm are superior to other prophets, that if, if Yaqub is an imam and he's not from the prophets of Ulul Azm, then by default, we would have to assume that Nuh, Ibrahim, Musa, Isa, and our prophet, they're imams. It seems that that would that would make sense. Now, there's just a comment. So we can never reach at the level of the imams when it comes to namaz khushu khushu as a human being. If you'd like to maybe comment on that. Now, it's we can't say we can't say that it's humanly impossible. It is humanly possible, but Allah knows that only these individuals will will achieve their uh, their full human potential. So it's it's within the realm of possibility, but Allah knows that we're not going to be able to to reach those levels. But that doesn't mean that we don't strive. You know, you you have to try to emulate because if if you try to emulate someone like Ali ibn Abi Talib, someone like our imams, if you make them the, the threshold, the benchmark, even if you fall short, you still reach the rank of Salman or Abu Dhar or Miqdad or Ammar ibn Yasa. So, you know, you have to shoot for that 100% because even if you fail, you still hopefully will, will, uh, will achieve uh, high ranks. So your, your spiritual goal should be very optimistic and ambitious whereby even if you fail you still you still achieve greatness uh, thank you and here's a question about last week's class uh, it's, it's asking if you could please share the source for the ranking of the ululism prophets like the like uh, how after prophet ibrahim is the second after prophet muhammad for example the uh, the ranking of the prophets, how they compare to each other? Also, uh, the question is, what what's the evidence that Ibrahim is, is superior to uh, to the others? Is that what the question is? Yeah, exactly. So, so if you want the source, I, I would have to look for the source. But uh, we have some hadith that speak about these the unique status of Ibrahim alayhi salam on. Uh, on the day of judgment. And there are some other uh, narrations, but I would have to, I don't know the source 
off the top of my head. Inshallah, Zain, remind me uh, so for next class I can uh, I can mention the source uh, to substantiate uh, that claim. Inshallah. Yeah, inshallah. And also, do we know anything about the age difference between Prophet Lut and Prophet Ibrahim? If Ibrahim was started his message when he was fairly young, uh, how old around how old was Prophet Lut? I don't know. I, I was actually looking for that today, and I, I was also looking for the uh, the age difference between Ismail and Ishaq. The the narrations are not clear. We I don't I haven't come across uh, any reliable reports that would indicate uh, what their age was. But if uh, and we don't know. I mean, is is Lut older than uh, Ibrahim? Younger? That's also not clear. I don't know. So they're around the same age, I would imagine. But who's older than who? What's the uh, the age difference? Allah wa Allah. Sheikh, thank you very much. It was, a, it, really, it was really interesting to hear the rest of the story. So, uh, <laughs> inshallah, the last verse that we covered, ayah number 73, I hope, you know, uh, that was uh, clear and understandable to you. Uh, I can imagine that when, when, at least when I used to read this verse, I, I didn't, I thought that the part about وَأَوْحَيْنَا إِلَيْهِمْ فَعْلَ الْخَيْرَاتِ to me, that was something new, you know, you know, reading Tafsir al-Mizan and discovering that this wahi is, is different from the, uh, the revelation that's given to uh, prophets and uh, messengers. So hopefully you guys found that, uh, you know, uh, illuminating. So please keep in your dua, inshallah. We will reconvene uh, next week, uh, bi-idhnillah.